Number 10. Decapitated Gladiators There are things found by archaeologists like skulls and skeletons or mummies and treasures. But some things they discover paint a much darker picture of people's past lives and deaths. Archaeologists discovered a group of skeletons in York, England. This group of skeletons belonged to large men who all died before they turned 45. What makes this find so horrific is that all the men were decapitated. Whoever buried them also placed their heads with them, sometimes between their legs or feet and sometimes on their chests. Researchers don't know why so many of the skeletons found at the Driffold Terrace site had been decapitated. The remains are from between the 2nd and 4th centuries AD when the Roman Empire controlled this area. Because many of the skeletons were so tall and had signs of injuries, researchers think they might be the bones of gladiators. They may also have been Roman soldiers. Researchers also conducted genetic testing on seven of the decapitated skeletons. They found that six of them came from Britain and only one possibly came from Syria or Lebanon. Why do you think they were decapitated? Number 9. Chernobyl The Chernobyl disaster of 1986 was one of the darkest times in Ukrainian history. A nuclear reactor blew up following a combination of elements which led to an utter catastrophe. People were evacuated and they never returned. They were the lucky ones who survived, though no one came out of this scary situation well. An exclusion zone covering an incredible 260,000 miles was established, and inside that zone is a radioactive vehicle graveyard. Situated close to the village of Rosoka, this dumping ground represents the massive Chernobyl rescue effort. Various types of vehicles, from trucks to fire engines to helicopters, are on display, though we don't recommend you go visit. This place may be on the outskirts of the zone, but believe us, the danger level is high. And this nearly four decades on from the disaster. Unbelievable, right? Some sources state that what's known as the micro R level reads at between 20,000 and 60,000 hourly. It's a little complex to go into here, but micro R relates to red blood cells, or RBCs, picking up abnormalities in the bloodstream. The vehicles would have been involved in activities such as clearing up debris. There was also the small matter of building the steel sarcophagus needed to seal off the reactor's remains. How come the vehicles were just abandoned here? Aside from them being radioactive, it seemed to be the only practical thing to do. Authorities initially wanted to bury them all underground, but the plan didn't work out, so this seemed to be the best solution. Number 8. Hobbit Bone Cave When you think of hobbits, you no doubt imagine cozy hobbit holes, mugs of tea, and the occasional dragon burning up the place. This kind of hobbit is very different. Hobbits don't exist, of course, but some people have often compared modern human beings to them. Researchers found the remains of Homo floresensis in a scary cave called Liang Bua on the island of Flores, Indonesia in 2003. This Latin name translates as Flores man or human. Because examples such as the LB1 skeleton thought to be female have a small stature and large feet, they got experts thinking in a Middle Earth type way. Besides, this species has a low cranium, hunched up shoulders, and a broad pelvic region. When did they live? It's thought they were on the island between 190,000 and 50,000 years ago, relatively youthful in archaeological terms. These dates come from an analysis of details like tools rather than the remains themselves that only go back 100,000 years. This group is humanoid, but are they a whole other variety of humans like Neanderthals? The scientific jury appears to be out. Naysayers point to the tools found with these so-called hobbits, stating that the size of their brains meant they couldn't have made such items. Also, could the differences in appearance be because of disabilities? That debate goes on. In the meantime, experts tried to build a picture with what eerie evidence they had. They don't know for sure why Homo floresensis aren't around anymore. Did we Homo sapiens push them out of the circle of life? Guess we'll just have to keep digging. Number 7. Monster Bird Claw This may look like an old prop from Jurassic Park, but it's part of a living creature that took to the skies over 3,000 years ago. Now that's what we call scary. Even freakier is ancient tissue, which is still attached to the formidable claw. So what is this thing? It's the remains of a moa, a species that lived in the New Zealand area. While the specimen might be thousands of years old, the bird went extinct approximately 800 years ago. The claw was discovered in a cave on Mount Owen, part of New Zealand's South Island in 1987. Reassuring perhaps, not all moa birds were monsters like this. The largest ones reached a heart-stopping 12 feet in length. Yet the smaller ones were only about the size of a Christmas turkey, according to reports. The detail on the claw is truly out of this world. No wonder Star Wars actor Mark Hamill tweeted about the Talon in 2021, comparing it to his old foe, the Rancor. Number 6. Skeleton Puzzle An ancient skeleton is the remains of one person, right? 
That's not always the case, especially if this early find from 2001 is anything to go by. Put your jackets on, because we're headed for the chilly climate of Britain's Outer Hebrides. On an island called South Uist, there's a Bronze Age village called Clad Halan, which translates as cemetery find. And these aren't just any old mummies, but approximately 3,500-year-old bog mummies. Doesn't sound very glamorous, and to be honest, it isn't. But what is fascinating about these two examples is the journey they went through before finally being buried beneath a Bronze Age roadhouse. The man and woman, at least it's presumed that's what they were, passed away before being submerged in peat for preservation. They stayed there for about 12 months. After this, they appear to have been placed in a crouching position and then wrapped up. What comes next? The burial? Oh no. The evidence shows that they weren't laid to rest for hundreds of years. That's pretty scary, right? Experts believe the mummies would have become part of the community and spoken to an irreverent tone. We're not saying that's normal, just that back then, bodies weren't simply stuck in the ground and largely forgotten about. It was probably a standard routine for people to speak to mummies. Eventually, the mummies were buried. What prompted this isn't clear. The juicy part concerns who the bones belong to. Both had certain bones swapped over, making the mummies a weird and scary jigsaw puzzle of sorts. With the Bronze Age man, his jaw and whole body belonged to someone else at one point, and it was a similar setup to the woman. So what was going on here? Ultimately, we don't know. Did these skeletons receive an organic upgrade? Or is this some strange ritual we know little about? Tell me what you think in the comments and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet. Number 5. My Own Private Idaho Snake Pit Our next scary story has a twist in the tail, or should that be T-A-I-L? This place in rural Idaho is surely Indiana Jones's worst nightmare. And it isn't some tomb or other ancient location, it's a former family home. The property turned out to be packed with snakes, hundreds of them. Not only did the house make your skin crawl, but the house itself was also crawling, what with all the creatures slipping and sliding around under the floor and in the walls. How come an innocent family wound up living in this slippery hellhole? Reports say their estate agent told them the stories they were hearing about snakes were made up. Once they moved in, they realized this was far from the case. Thankfully, the snakes in question were garter snakes, which are largely venom-free. That said, they still bite and threaten the family. At one stage, dozens had to be killed every day. Why were all the snakes in the house in the first place? Unfortunately, the property was built over what's called a hibernaculum. This is a natural hub where snakes go to hibernate during the colder months. The snakes were there first, but what a horrible experience for everybody. As if things weren't bad enough, the family filed for bankruptcy and had to leave the house. They lasted about three months in the house, a short amount of time in some ways, but also a remarkably long time to put up with a crowd of live-in snakes, right? Number 4. Man Inside Tree When you've been brutally stabbed to death, the last thing you expect is for your body to be attacked by a tree. Yet, that's exactly what happened in County Sligo, Northwest Ireland. We should point out that the two incidents happened several hundred years apart. The skeleton, which belonged to a young man of around 20 years of age, dated back to medieval times over 900 years ago. The tree, a beech, was a mere 200 years old. What happened was the tree got planted where the young man was buried, and over time the roots took hold of his bones. Flash forward to 2015 when a big storm battered the location, tearing the tree out of the earth. The roots then yanked the top part of the skeleton from the bottom half, resulting in a scary but fascinating archaeological find. Believed to have had a Christian burial, it isn't known why the man suffered such a violent end. It certainly wasn't uncommon back then. Experts sometimes spend ages raking over the soil for signs of historical evidence. This time, Mother Nature lent a helping hand. Or to be more accurate, branch. Number 3. Mesoamerican Sacrifice Pit Is this the site where unfortunate human beings were fed to big cats in ancient Mesoamerica? Possibly, though the jury's still out. Hundreds of years ago, Teotihuacan was a major and highly populated destination close to today's Mexico City. Temples were constructed, the remains of which are explored by archaeologists in the 21st century. And what the Mesoamerican culture left behind is incredible. Oh, and somewhat scary. Chambers contain remnants of the animal kingdom's mightiest predators. Pumas and eagles are amongst the finds, and also they appear to have been locked up there. Analysis of the remains shows their bones came under the stresses we associate with captive creatures. Before this, archaeologists identified the zoo at Tenochtitlan, also known as the Aztec's capital city, as the oldest society keeping carnivores. The unusual presence of what could be corn in their diet shows humans fed the animals. And speaking of which, did they chow down on any human hands and other body parts? It's easy to look at this place and compare it to other ancient civilizations where people were sacrificed or slaughtered for entertainment. 
The overall picture simply isn't clear enough, though sources point out old drawings which show animals eating human organs. Number 2. The Scary Truth About Pineapples It's pretty strange how acid plays such a big role in our day-to-day -day life. Hold up, acid? What do we mean? Not only do our stomachs contain acid that's strong enough to rival a car battery, but we also consume acidic foods such as fruit. Pineapples are so acidic that it's actually kind of scary. Did you know that when you put a slice of pineapple in your mouth, you're causing distress to your flesh? Zesty and zingy it might be, but the fruit also stings and burns our tongues. This is because of a natural ingredient, or rather an enzyme of the pineapple, called bromelain. Its role is to break down proteins in much the same way as our digestive system does. So what's it doing eating us as we eat it? You can see it that way. Thankfully, as scientists have shown, our mouths recover quickly enough from a pineapple hit. Ultimately, the fruity treat is just too dang tasty to ignore, acid or no acid. Number 1. Hyksos Hand Pit So, we told you a little earlier about a scary archaeological discovery with lots of animal bones in a temple. We're about to go one scarier by mentioning an ancient discovery of hands at a site in Egypt. What is it about severed hands that's so freaky? We just can't put our finger on it. Well, these unfortunate people couldn't at any rate. What did the king want with lopped off hands anyway? The Hyksos ruled over areas of the country during a period referred to as the 15th Dynasty. Experts were aware of enemies having their hands removed back then, but they had found no physical signs of this until this discovery, which happened in 2012. The former Hyksos capital of Avaris was the location where archaeologists found the 16 amputated parts. They noticed four pits inside a palace. Each pit contained human hands, though they were distributed strangely. Two of the hands had a pit all to themselves, while the others got divided between the other two pits. Sounds weird, though the pits with a single hand are close to where the king sat, so maybe that makes sense. Could these have been more notable amputees? By taking someone's hand, specifically their right hand, you would deprive them of strength. That, and it's easier to count severed hands than it is whole corpses. The hands then apparently got swapped for gold. You could give your ruler the finger, and he wouldn't just welcome it, he'd reward you with something valuable. Maybe the king kept the hands around like ornaments, we guess. Not our idea of interior design, but hey, it worked for them. 10. Milford on Sea Defenses Weathering and erosion along England's southern coast in recent years has revealed a three mile to stretch of shoreline near the village of Milford on Sea. The shoreline is covered in World War II era coastal defenses. The structures, which consist of a field of metal poles and concrete posts, intertwined with barbed wire and pillboxes, were put in place in 1940, just in case the Germans tried invading along the coast. At the time, the Nazi Blitzkrieg bombing campaign was taking place across the UK. Defenses like these were implemented during a heightened fear of German invasion in 1940 and 1941, sparked by the Nazi mission to invade Britain known as Operation Sea Lion. The military prepped by dramatically transforming much of England's coast, especially in the southern part of the country where the General Headquarters Anti-Tank Line or GHQ was installed from Bristol to the south of London all the way to York. Consisting of pillboxes and anti-tank trenches, structures like these were meant to protect England's capital and major industrial regions. After the war, they were abandoned and became covered by the English Channel. Over the years, sea storms and tides eroded the coast, eventually revealing the structures. Once they reappeared, local authorities warned beachgoers not to go into the water in certain places and at certain times, including during high tide, when the defenses were hidden beneath the sea. Local authorities ultimately decided to remove the structures and said that they expected more of them to be found as Mother Nature continues to wear away at the coastline. Very few of the defense mechanisms that were put in place remain today. Most of what remains are reinforced metal and concrete structures like those found at Milford on Sea. 9. Top Secret Arctic Nazi Base over 3 million German soldiers invaded the Soviet Union in 1941 under the command of Adolf Hitler. The following year, the Nazis built a top-secret base in the high Arctic on Alexandria Land, an island located in the Barents Sea. Dubbed Schatzgraber or Treasure Hunter, the base was part of a network of tactical weather-watching stations that the Germans used during World War II. Scientists from the Russian Arctic National Park revealed the site's existence in 2016. They were the first researchers to thoroughly explore the base, where they collected over 600 artifacts. 
The island was littered with food canisters, weapons, ammunition, batteries, emergency flares, and other equipment that the Nazis left behind when the site closed. Operations at Schatzgrub are ground to a halt in 1944, when staff members ate contaminated polar bear meat and got sick. The only person who avoided falling ill was a vegetarian. The German military evacuated everyone, and nobody ever returned. Today, the base is in ruins. In addition to the artifacts collected there, all that's left of the once heavily fortified site are the remnants of tents, bunkers, fuel drums, and an airstrip. 8. Revolutionary War Medal In 1781, the US Continental Congress authorized the creation of a medal commemorating Revolutionary War General Daniel Morgan, who months earlier had led the colonists to an unexpected victory at the Battle of Cowpens. The piece measures 2.2 inches, 5.6 centimeters in diameter, with one side depicting Morgan leading his troops against the British in battle, while the other side shows him receiving a crown from a Native American woman. The medal was presented to Morgan in 1790. After his death, it was passed on to his grandson, who kept it in a Philadelphia bank vault. It was stolen in a bank robbery in 1818 and was never seen again. Congress struck a new copy of the medal in 1839 and gave it to Morgan's great-grandson. It remained in the family until 1885 and was eventually acquired by J.P. Morgan. From there, it vanished, leading many to believe it had been lost or melted down. Earlier this year, coin expert John Kraljevich was tasked with authenticating a piece that someone had anonymously consigned to auction. He instantly recognized it as the 1839 Daniel Morgan Medal, the only one ever struck. Speaking with CBS News, Kraljevich described it as the most shocking and important discovery in America coin collecting in years. Pre-auction estimates put the medal's value at somewhere between $250,000 and $500,000 but it ended up selling for nearly twice that much, fetching a record $960,000. It outranks the previous high price for an American medal, which was a congressional gold medal given to General William Henry Harrison during the War of 1812. It sold for $600,000 last year. 7. Secret Suitcase In 2018, a man named David McGee spoke to National Public Radio about his grandfather, who died before he was born. David's grandmother, Effie, had a suitcase that she never opened and was very secretive about. Whenever David asked her about it or tried to look inside, she gave him a short answer and quickly shut the suitcase. Twenty years after Effie passed away, David finally decided to open it. The suitcase had sat in his basement gathering dust as he mentally prepared for whatever might be inside. It contained paperwork about David's grandfather, Sergeant Willie F. Williams, who died during World War II. Nobody in David's family had ever talked about the man, but Effie clearly kept him close to her heart, amassing a collection of letters, Western Union telegrams, medals, photos, and more. David learned from the records inside the suitcase that his grandfather served in an all-African-American military unit and that he died while doing his job of managing ammunition and explosives. David and his wife did some research and learned that Sergeant Williams is buried in the Netherlands in the American military cemetery in Margraten. The couple flew there together and paid their respects. The trove of documents that David found not only helped him learn more about his family history, it's an imperative contribution to the stories of black soldiers who died in World War II. Many people are surprised to learn that there's limited information available about these fallen troops. But this is certainly the case, especially given the tendency for the historical narrative to omit details that don't fit with the times. In other words, racism has obscured black voices from World War II stories, making discoveries like this extremely important. Have you ever found an important piece of family history in an unexpected place? Tell us about it in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it. 6. Civil War Cannonballs In the wake of Hurricane Ida last year, Nearly 200 Civil War-era cannonballs were found at Perdido Key along Florida's Gulf Coast. Gulf Island's National Seashore GUIS Superintendent Darrell Eccles said that it was unclear whether the cannonballs were left behind by the Union or the Confederacy, or if they were associated with nearby Fort McCree. They were found in a remote area that's only accessible by boat, ATV, or on foot. 
GUIS detonated more than 190 of the cannonballs, with help from other federal agencies. Eccles advised the public not to touch anything that resembles munitions or doesn't quite look right, and reminded beachgoers that it's illegal to harm, deface, damage, or remove a cultural artifact. Built during the 1830s, Fort McCree was seized by the Confederate Army in 1861. From there, soldiers fired across the channel at Fort Pickens, which was occupied by the Union at the time. Fort McCree sustained heavy damage from Union attacks, and it fell further into ruin after the war as the tides and waves battered it. By 1906, the fort was completely leveled. 5. Unexploded Bombs Rail commuters in Hampshire, England faced an unusual delay to their train service in late 2021 when construction workers discovered an unexploded World War II-era bomb just 65 feet 20 meters from the track. Just days earlier, a World War II explosive injured four people when it detonated at a construction site in Munich, Germany. Not wanting to take any chances, authorities suspended service along numerous train lines after the bomb in Hampshire was found. An explosive ordnance disposal team was dispatched to the site to safely dispose of it. The explosion in Munich two days beforehand was an unusual event. Old bombs are found quite frequently in Germany, so construction sites are usually thoroughly inspected beforehand to verify they're free of munitions. In most cases, any bombs that are present at the site are found and disposed of in controlled explosions. Authorities said that they were looking into how the weapon had gone unnoticed. 4. Cold War Era Stretchers In 2021, a truck crashed into a historic pedestrian bridge in Washington, D.C. and caused it to collapse. Workers from the Department of Energy and Environment were cleaning up asbestos the following month when they found decades-old stacked boxes filled with military stretchers inside the bridge's foundation. Dated to 1954, the stretchers were shipped to a local elementary school that has since been closed down. They may have been left over from the Korean War and were likely part of a surplus redistribution program that gave away supplies for disaster preparedness. Doug Harsha, who works as a curator at the Cold War Museum in Virginia, told NBC Washington that the stretchers are an example of how Washington, D.C. was ahead of the rest of the nation when it came to preparing for a possible nuclear attack. He explained the type of readiness seen in D.C. was generally not seen anywhere else until the early 1960s. Many stretchers were found in good condition. Some were given to the Cold War Museum, but most will be thrown away. It's unknown how they ended up inside of a pedestrian bridge, but Harsha believes that there were probably more Cold War emergency supplies stashed in places throughout Washington, D.C. 3. Lost Tank Blueprint The British-made Mark I tank was the first tank ever used in combat, and it proved to be a game-changer when it came to winning the First World War. It was designed in 1915 as a way to break the stalemate of trench warfare, by enabling soldiers to traverse through craters and ram through barbed wire on the Western Front. When an enemy soldier saw the tank approaching for the first time, they reportedly shouted, The Devil is Coming! The tracked vehicle's blueprints were believed to be lost to history until recently, when auctioneer Paul Laidlaw announced that the only known copy would soon be sold at auction, along with a 20-page patent description. The blueprint's value is estimated at over $27,000, and the patent description is worth around $13,600. Described as a lozenge-shaped vehicle propelled by an endless moving chain track, the Mark I tank was first used in 1916 in the Battle of the Somme. The only known surviving example is on display at the Tank Museum in Dorset, England. Naturally, if a blueprint were to exist, it would probably also be there, yet the museum doesn't have one. So, it came to a huge surprise when Laidlaw received a call from a vendor who was looking to sell his copy. Speaking with Wales Online, the auctioneer said that the seller was unaware of the blueprint's value. The documents had been quietly handed down through the person's family for quite some time, which explains why nobody knew they existed. And it leaves us to wonder, what other treasures are sitting in people's attics and storage rooms, going completely unnoticed? 2. Soldier's Handbook a Grand Rapids, Michigan man named Doug Fassberg had a lot of belongings to go through when he inherited his deceased father's estate in late 2020. His dad was an avid collector of many things, some of which related to the military in some way. While digging through a box of items, he came across an old U.S. military soldier's handbook. 
The pages were yellowed and fragile, but the writing on them was clear enough for Fassberg to identify a soldier named Max B. Wendland, who'd enlisted in Detroit in 1901. Wendland kept track of his monthly pay and also listed the names of several other soldiers, who Fassberg speculated may have been friends who died in World War I. Inside the book, there were some colorful folded inserts that turned out to be military money, including a 10 cent certificate and two German bills. Fassberg and his wife decided it was only right to reunite the book with the surviving descendant of Mr. Wendland. The couple got in touch with a local genealogist for help tracking someone down and put out the word that they were hoping to hear from any living relatives. 1. German World War Cannon While digging up a baseball field for the construction of a public school in late 2020, a construction crew in Amherstburg, Ontario discovered a World War I-era German cannon. Local mayor Aldo De Carlo revealed that the cannon had arrived in the town in 1922 and was put on display at a local high school. It was buried in 1971 when the schools were expanded. By then, the cannon was in bad shape. The gun was soon forgotten about, and in the late 1980s, a ballpark was built on top of it. Upon its rediscovery, local manager of policy and committees Kevin Fox explained that the cannon is a rare find. During World War II, Many war prizes were scrapped to contribute to the war effort amid a metal shortage. The weapon may have been used in the Battle of Vimy Ridge, which occurred in the northernmost region of France in April 1917 and was fought between German and Canadian forces. The school district donated the cannon to the town of Amherstburg. Number 10. Sea Wolf Class Submarines the United States. The Sea Wolf class submarines were the most advanced submarines constructed during their time. They're the world's most sophisticated and expensive hunter killer submarines. They reclaimed the United States Navy's previous technological advantage. Between 1945 through the late 1980s, they dominated the seas over the Soviets for decades until spying and deceptive commercial activities diminished it. These submarines were the fastest ever created. While most subs reach top speeds of 5 knots, the Seawolf class easily exceeds that range, cruising at 28 miles an hour. They can dive to greater depths, diving 1,600 feet below the ocean's surface. They also have structural traits that allow them to function beneath the Arctic ice cap. Their weaponry system would make a potential U.S. adversary reassess their stance, as defeating the Seawolf class boat remains a pipe dream. Designers equipped it with eight 660mm torpedo tubes, and the crew can launch sub-harpoon anti-ship missiles from these tubes. These terms sound complicated even to me, but to put it in layman's terms, this sub's attack system can launch a missile with a range of 1,056 miles. I doubt any country would want to deal with the U.S. Navy knowing how much strength they boast. The U.S. Navy expected the Sea Wolf class to cost $33.6 billion in 1991, accounting for 25% of the total Navy construction budget, making it the most expensive naval construction program ever. The U.S. Navy was also planning an extra 17 warships. Then, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, American policymakers questioned the necessity for more ultra-quiet subs. The Navy reduced the class to three subs at a total cost of $7.3 billion. That works out to more than $2.4 billion per submarine. The Sea Wolf class gradually recovered the technological advantage that the U.S. Navy had over the Soviets from 1945 until the mid-1980s, when espionage and some of the U.S. allies' deceptive trading tactics weakened it. General Dynamics Electric Boat Division built the new submarines to operate at greater depths than existing submarines the United States had. They also had designed them to hunt down and destroy the most advanced Soviet ballistic missile subs, such as the Typhoon class, as well as assault submarines like the Akula. Number 9. Grainy class submarines from Russia. NATO gave this submarine the code name Project 885 Yasin, and it is the latest Russian nuclear submarine. It is a more capable and technologically advanced alternative to the current Akula class subs. These new submarines are a lot more expensive. Designers laid out plans for the Severodvinsk, the lead boat, in 1993, but they halted the project in 1996 because of budget issues. The government provided extra funding for the project in 2003, and work on it proceeded. In 2013, the Russian Navy received the lead boat. They officially commissioned it in 2014. The Grainy class subs are larger than the Akula class subs that came before them. These new Russian submarines pack serious assault machinery. They can also attack other submarines and ships while searching for and destroying threatening ballistic missile submarines. Coastal targets such as naval stations and ports are also likely targets for these water machines. For various cruise missile missions, there are 24 vertical launch tubes in these subs. There are also eight 650-millimeter torpedo tubes for anti-ship missiles. 
According to reliable sources, Grainy carries 30 torpedoes and anti-ship missiles. The crew can replace torpedoes with mines. They installed torpedo tubes behind the central station's chamber. There are an additional two 533mm torpedo tubes to boost its prowess. Finally, there's a single pressurized water reactor on the Grainy-class submarine. This reactor has a service life of roughly 25 to 30 years and does not require refueling. Their food supplies are the only limit to these subs' endurance. According to some reports, these Russian subs are substantially slower than the Virginia and Seawolf-class boats of the United States. Number 8. Ohio-class Ballistic Missile Submarines United States The Ohio-class submarines which were designed in the 1970s are the largest submarines ever built for the U.S. Navy, with only the Russian Navy's Soviet-designed Typhoon-class and Bore-class being larger. Despite their smaller size than the Russian subs, the Ohio-class submarines carry 24 Trident II missiles compared to the Typhoon's 20 and the original Bore's 16. The Ohio class has been an important part of the United States nuclear deterrent triad throughout their service. Currently, half of the nation's active strategic thermonuclear weapons are carried by 14 operational submarines. Between 1981 and 1997, General Dynamics Electric Boat Division in Groton, Connecticut built 18 Ohio class subs. The Navy is currently stationed to the Pacific Fleet submarines at Bangor, Washington, while they stationed the Atlantic Fleet submarines in Kings Bay, Georgia. The submarines spend about 70 days at sea during deployment, followed by 25 days in the dock for maintenance. Each of the Ohio-class submarines spends at least 66% of its time at sea. General Dynamics built the submarines with three huge logistics hatches, which provide enough supply and repair openings, thus saving time at the port whenever the personnel are undertaking turnover and replenishment. The hatches enable the sailors to move supply pallets, equipment replacement modules, and other mechanical components swiftly. They also designed the subs to last for at least 15 years between overhauls. Number 7. Astute-class submarines United Kingdom The Astute-class submarines are the Royal Navy's largest, most modern, and most powerful attack submarines, integrating world-class sensors, design, and weapons in a multi-purpose submarine. These subs showed their capacity to assemble and launch Tomahawk missiles in the first half of 2012, successfully firing two missiles from the Gulf of Mexico, and hitting targets on a test range in northern Florida. A pressurized water reactor designed by Rolls-Royce powers the Astute, eliminating the need for refueling. The nuclear reactor aboard the submarine only needs one refit throughout its service life rather than the usual two. The sub has limitless endurance and can provide crew members with an unlimited air and water supply. The number of provisions carried for the crew normally lasts up to 90 days. Designers fitted six torpedo tubes capable of shooting spearfish heavyweight torpedoes on these subs. For land and attack missions, it also launches Raytheon Tomahawk cruise missiles. It has enough room to store up to 38 weapons. Number 6. Virginia-class submarines, United States Virginia-class subs are astonishingly scary to its rivals. What makes this submarine so dangerous to countries like Russia and China? Following the continued modifications, the U.S. Navy's Block 5 Virginia-class attack submarines will become more lethal and powerful. The Block 5 variant is bigger and has more weapons than the Virginia-class modifications before it. This means they're virtually as big as ballistic missile submarines of the Ohio class. Longer means more missile tubes and a whopping 76% increase in missile slots. These upgrades could be the most powerful submarine ever in the U.S. fleet. These submarines can fire advanced heavyweight guided torpedoes and can lay hammerhead mines. They can launch Tomahawk Block 5 land attack and anti-ship cruise missiles, which are the most recent version of the Tomahawk, and can adjust course and make new target corrections while in flight. Virginia-class subs perform a variety of Blue Sea and Coastal Shore missions, including eavesdropping for intelligence and deploying Navy SEAL troops. With their superior handling system, the subs perform well close to shore. How long would you be able to stay below the sea in a submarine? Let me know how brave you are in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more cool stuff. Number 5. Sierra 2 class submarines, Russia The Sierra-class nuclear fast attack submarines were among the most lethal submarines ever built. The Sierras, as a successor to the more numerous victors and the mini Akulas, which still form the backbone of the Russian submarine fleet, heavily outnumbered the faster Alphas. These submarines promised to be more capable, longer-lasting, and more lethal than the Soviet undersea fleet's second-generation victors, Charlies, and Alphas in the 1980s. The Sierra possessed the makings of the ultimate Soviet attack sub, diving faster and deeper than the victors and Charlies with higher endurance and superior weaponry than the Alphas. Those interested in Soviet attack submarines are probably the only ones who remember them today. The Sierra has faded into oblivion for a variety of reasons, whereas the Akulas are well known and constantly in the headlines. The first is that they were extremely difficult to construct. Even more so than the high-performance Alphas, the entire titanium hull caused extensive labor and money. 
They built only four, two each of the Sierra first and second classes because of the prohibitive cost. The second is that despite their superior abilities, the Akulas could complete the same task at a substantially lower operational cost. The third and final cause for their disappearance was the Soviet Union's economic stagnation and impending demise. They remain among the most lethal subs ever created. Number 4. Soryu Class Submarines Japan Mitsubishi Heavy Industries and Kawasaki Shipbuilding Corporation constructed the diesel-electric submarines named Soryu Class for the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. It's an upgraded version of the Oyashiyu submarine. The Japanese Navy named the Soryu after a World War II aircraft. It was one carrier involved in the attack on Pearl Harbor. In March 2005, designers laid out the keel for the first submarine in the class Soryu SS-501. The Navy commissioned it in March 2009 after being launched in December 2007. They launched the second submarine, SS-502, in October 2008 and commissioned it in March 2010. They laid it out in March 2006, launched it in October 2008 and commissioned it in March 2010. The hydrodynamic design of the Soryu is based on the Oyashiyu-class submarine. It has the largest displacement of any submarine class in the Japanese Navy. They built the hull using high tensile steel and coated it with a special coating to decrease acoustic wave reflection. The sub has control panels that are computer-assisted. They incorporated highly automated systems into their design. They also installed Stirling engines to improve propulsion performance and underwater endurance. The engine supports superior submerged activities. Surveillance capabilities are improved because of the onboard high-performance sonar. The sub also has upgraded safety features such as snorkeling equipment and stealth capabilities. Number 3. Akula-class submarines from Russia Although the Soviet Union created hot rod submarines that could travel faster, take more damage, and dive deeper than their American equivalents, the United States Navy was certain that it had the Soviet submarines outmatched since they were all extremely loud. The quieter American submarines had a better chance of discovering their Soviet counterparts first and meeting them with a homing torpedo if the superpowers clashed. The Soviet Navy's Akula-class nuclear-powered assault submarines shattered that faith in the mid-1980s. They're still the mainstay of Russia's nuclear attack submarine fleet 30 years later and are quieter than most of their American equivalents. The huge Akula, which displaced about 13,000 tons underwater, had a double steel hull which was typical of Soviet submarines and allowed the vessel to take in more ballast water and withstand greater damage. They wrapped the motor unit of the attack submarine to reduce noise and special tiles covered its outside and inner surfaces. Even the limber holes in the Akula's outer hull that allowed water to pass through had retractable covers to reduce sonic returns. The beautiful aqua-dynamic conning tower and the torpedo-shaped pod atop the tail fin, which could deploy a towed passive sonar array, set the vessel apart. A crew of roughly 70 can operate the sub for 100 days at sea. The high acoustic stealth properties of Akula will continue to make it a formidable anti-submarine warfare vessel. Number 2. Improved Los Angeles Class, United States The Los Angeles Class has formed the backbone of the U.S. Navy's attack submarine fleet since its inception in the mid-1970s. The Navy had the submarines built to escort carrier task groups and needed to travel at high speeds underwater to keep up with surface forces. The subs are among the world's most modern subsea watercraft of their kind. Though anti-submarine warfare remains its primary role, its natural qualities of stealth, mobility, and endurance can also be exploited to meet the difficulties of today's shifting global geopolitical context. They can also use the subs for various secondary duties including intelligence gathering, show of force missions, special forces insertion, strike missions, mining, and search and rescue. Each ship is roughly 362 feet long and weighs around 2,000 tons, which is significantly heavier than the previous Sturgeon class. Designers separated the submarines into two separate compartments that are both waterproof. The forward compartment houses all the ship's living arrangements and control spaces, while the aft compartment houses most of the ship's engineering systems. 13 officers and 131 sailors make up the crew of this sub. It's estimated that each submarine cost around $900 million in 1999 dollars, which is almost $1.7 billion today. Number 1. Oscar II Class Submarine, Russia the Russian Navy primarily entered the Oscar II class of cruise missile submarines to strike NATO aircraft carriers and battle groups. In the early 1990s, the Russian Navy attempted to preserve its core submarine force capabilities to deal with resource challenges. The Russian Navy has continued to build new subs. It completed four third-generation Oscar II submarines in the late 1990s. Between 1985 and 1999, they built 11 bigger Oscar II submarines. They've decommissioned three of the ships, and one of them, the Kursk, has permanently sunk. The Northern Fleet has two Oscar II submarines while the Pacific Fleet has five. These submarines measure 508 feet in length, dive 1,968 feet in depth, and have a displacement of 24,000 tons. Each sub can accommodate 107 crew members. 
The submarine is an improved version of Project 949 with one more compartment enhancing the interior organization of the weapons and equipment. It delivers missile strikes on groups of ships and coastal installations. The Oscar II is a 10-compartment ship with a double-hull design. The reinforced spherical cover of the sail pierces the ice of the Arctic ice cap. Within the retractable area of the ship are two periscopes, a radio sextant, and radar masts. The submarine also has cruise missiles with a range of 342 miles. The missile is 34 feet long and weighs 6.9 tons, carrying a 2,205-pound warhead. That is true Russian enchantment. Would you rather be stuck in a sub with a hundred stinky guys or be stranded by yourself on a beautiful desert island for a month? Let me know what you think in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe for more amazing videos and we'll see you soon for another amazing video right here on American Eye.